It looked like a scene from a movie, but it was real. Witnesses say with a gleam in his eye, the 34-year-old pulled his stolen tank onto Mesa College Drive. These pictures taken from the San Diego police helicopter. The real destruction came minutes later when he decided to roll through a neighborhood and Ashford Street had the unlucky distinction of being in the way. There he barreled over parked car after parked car, crushing them as if they were cans of soda, leaving mashed metal and shocked residents behind. After passing Ross Elementary School, the man with the 57-ton weapon decided to head for some busy streets. His imprint would be left on convoy and Balboa. He aimed for fire hydrants and power poles and traffic lights. He hit them. A surrealistic sight as a tank drove past fast food restaurants and busy intersections. It was about 20 minutes into the rampage and the beginning of the end when he pulled onto the freeway, first southbound 805, then 163. Dozens of police cars trailed behind, but how exactly do you stop a tank? He finally stopped himself when he ran into the center divider on 163, just north of Genesee. Officers quickly climbed atop the tank, opened the hatch, told him to get out. He didn't. According to police, he then tried to get the tank moving again. Police shot him. He was already dead when he arrived at Sharp Hospital minutes later. The Nelson brothers were in the plumbing business together. Friends say Sean was acting strangely lately. He wasn't working much, he was short on cash, and he broke up with his girlfriend. Neighbors say he was digging a tunnel in his backyard looking for gold. He said that he had found gold, and me and my friend went over there to look at it, and we thought it was clay. Digging at night and floodlights out there mowing his lawn at nighttime it seemed a little strange to me. Nelson graduated from Madison High School in 1978. He went into the Army where he was trained as a tank crew member. And when he was in his early 20s, he had a job on a tuna boat. He was my best friend. I was best man in his wedding. And uh, none of the stuff that uh, has been said about him as far as being crazy and psychotic and all that shit is true. Neighbors say he was quiet, but a little unusual. My son called me last night and said, Mom, watch the 11 o'clock news. Somebody's going crazy in a tank. And he turned out to be your neighbor. And it turned out to be my neighbor, and I was shocked. Scott has talked about some of the problems his brother faced, among them a drug problem, a paranoia of the government. Of course, we'll have more on this for you later on in the other news, newscast tonight. For now, let's go back to the news desk with Rory, Margaret, and Roland. Thanks, John. Interesting, John, that, that he really, when you asked him who he blamed this on, he said he doesn't blame on anybody, but he does blame it on drugs. Right. He has no malice towards the police for this, um, no malice towards anybody in particular. He, he does blame the drug problem and something he tried to help him with and he felt he could not help him with. Okay. And a lot of unfortunate things led up to the drug problem. He lost his job, lost his equipment, had an injury. It sounded like a real domino effect. His life basically fell apart on him, yeah. Okay. Well, we have more coverage of the tank rampage on the streets of San Diego. Is it loud? We thought, like I said, I thought it was a plane crashing right here. It wasn't a plane, but a tank, crushing everything in its way. It rolled on down 805, then 163. It seemed there was little that could stop it. Then the driver apparently tried to ram through the center divide onto the opposite side of the freeway. He didn't make it. The tank was stuck, its wheels spinning in air. Police moved in. We warn you what happened next is graphic. A pair of bolt cutters let them open the hatch. Officers say they told the driver to surrender, but they say when he tried to start up again, they shot him. They pulled him from the tank. He was transported to a hospital where he died soon after from the gunshot wound. This is what it looked like from above as seen by officers in the police helicopter. 57 tons of steel showing no sign of stopping and showing little respect for the legion of patrol cars in its wake. He tried to get off the freeway, now he's heading south, 163. The pursuit continued on to Highway 163. As the tank neared the Genesee off-ramp, the driver veered to the left and tried to steer the tank over the center divider. That's when this surreal event came to an end. Officers used bolt cutters to open the hatch and yelled at the driver to surrender. Police say when he tried to work the gears, he was shot. The entire incident has left people baffled. I just can't believe people do things like that. We have an exclusive interview with one of the officers who ended up jumping on top of that tank to stop the chase. This cop operated a tank during Desert Storm. I know people look at it as a vehicle or a tank. That was a, that was a moving weapon. That was the biggest weapon on the loose in the city of San Diego yesterday. 
Why wouldn't they mace him? Why wouldn't they do anything? They shot the guy and left with no answers. The police wasted no time explaining their actions. News 8's Pat Gaffey has their story. The rampage lasted more than 23 minutes from the time when the tank was stolen at the National Guard Armory to the fatal shot from police into the hatch of the 58-ton armored vehicle. Had he been taken alive, Sean Nelson would have faced charges of assault with a deadly weapon for steering the tank at cars and vans, police and civilians. Nelson learned how to drive tanks in the U.S. Army. He trained at Fort Knox and served in a tank battalion in Germany. Near Children's Hospital, he went up on the median of southbound 163 and got stuck. A Marine Corps reservist who also has training in tanks was one of the police officers who climbed onto the tank and broke into the locked down hatch. Once they opened the hatch, because this officer knew a special way to open that hatch, they asked the driver, demanded the driver, ordered him to cease and to surrender. He refused. The police captain in charge of the case says there were four options at that point. Officers could enter the tank, but they didn't know if Nelson had guns. They could drop tear gas into the tank, which would disable the driver, but he and the tank might still go out of control. And if the officers went into the tank filled with tear gas, they'd be disabled. That left the option of lethal force. Police fired one shot at Nelson to keep him from getting loose again. The bullet hit Nelson in the shoulder and traveled down through his chest. He was pulled from the tank and pronounced dead at the hospital. Pat Gaffey, News 8. The ABLE helicopter video gives you a bird's eye view of what the people on the ground saw last night as the tank plowed its way through the residential streets around the armory. This was Ernest Farr's camping trailer being destroyed. That's just gone, so there's nothing we can do about that. It's a lucky thing it wasn't anybody in or anything. The tank pushed cars around like they were toys, or just rolled over and flattened everything in its path. I mean, it was like a nightmare. It's like a holocaust last night. This place is like a war zone. A war zone. We heard those words over and over again from the people along Ashford Street. Vicky Alfaro's car got flattened. No car. <laughs> it's flat. It's a pancake. It looks like a yellow pancake with two raisins on the top. And where there were crushed and broken cars last night, there was little left but broken glass this morning. I'll never forget that. Joe Brenna says the tank driver even talked to people as he drove. His head was like out of the tank, and he was yelling, Plumber Bob. And Bob Belton, who lost a few trees to the tank, did now, find a souvenir. Have? This part of the uh, uh, track off of the tank. As this happened a little before 7 o'clock is traffic. Uh, Highway 163 was closed down, parts of 8 were closed down, parts of 805 were closed down, and 163 really at one point was the world's largest parking lot. People waiting there for an hour and a half and upwards to try and get home. Question is, how do you get a 57-ton tank off a freeway? Well, obviously, it's not easy, and it's a problem that had to be addressed. Here's how you do it. You bring in a crane, which they did about 2.30 this morning, and with that crane, they were able to lift the tank onto flatbed trucks. People applauded. People were out there at 2.30 in the morning watching all this. One of the major concerns, of course, was to get the tank off the freeway before the morning rush hour, because if you can imagine Highway 163 being closed as people are trying to get to work, it would be a mess uh, beyond our wildest dreams. It would be an absolute mess. That tank has now been brought to the National Guard Armory. It, of course, is being looked over. It's being examined with a fine tooth comb, looking for anything that might have happened to it. And, of course, one of the treads did come off when he hit the center divider there, which is what initially disabled the tank. Now, we received here in the newsroom last night a, a fax from Caltrans and the California Highway Patrol. And it's something that's fairly routine when there's a signal alert. They send us this list of, of the closures, 805 is closed, 163, et cetera. What's unusual, and I don't think we've ever seen before, is the reason for the signal alert. It says right here, tank stuck on center divider. Who would have thought anything like that could happen? We may never see the likes of this again. Final question tonight, how do you steal a tank from a National Guard armory? Well, there's a tank right back there, chain link fence, uh, barbed wire. If you want to, badly enough, of course, you can get through that. But then, how do you take the tank? Well, that's what News 8's Maria Velasquez was looking into today. He was going from tank to tank, trying to get into one, each one of the tanks. Oh. And I, um, I thought that he was somebody that was supposed to be back there. As we now know, Sean Nelson had no business there, and there were no formal procedures to make it anyone else's business.